Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Harvey Shapiro, and I'd like to welcome you to another of our, our regular uh, debates on public policy sponsored by the Smith Family Foundation. This event is also sponsored by the American Islamic Congress. Tonight we want to deal with the question of whether the U.S. can and should and might and may enter into discussions, negotiations, and deal-making with Iran and some of the other nations in the Middle East. Uh, we hope to explore a number of aspects of that question. We've assembled, I think, an interesting group of panelists, each of whom will share some views with us, and I will ask them some questions as well. Let me tell you who's with us, starting on my immediate left. Uh, Steve Clemens is a senior fellow and a director of the American Strategy Program at the New American Foundation. Uh, he's probably better known to many of us as a publisher of the very popular political blog called The Washington Note. He has been an advisor on uh, economic and international affairs for Senator Jeff Bingham, uh, Bingaman of New Mexico. And prior to moving to Washington, he served as an executive director of the Japan American Society of Southern Cal California. Uh, he's joined by Hillel Friedkin, who's currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and he's the director of the Hudson Institute's Center for Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World. Prior to joining Hudson, he was active in um, several foundations. Uh, he was a W.H. Uh, Brady Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He also served with the uh, uh, Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation and was a program officer with the John M. Olin Foundation. He has also taught at the University of Chicago, uh, Yale, and a number of other schools, and was a member of the uh, National Council of the Humanities. Uh, next to him is Justin Logan, who is a foreign policy analyst at the Cato Institute in Washington. His primary research interests include nuclear proliferation, uh, promotion of democracy, and U.S. foreign policy with regard to uh, China, Russia, and a number of other countries. Uh, he has written for a number of publications on foreign policy issues. And finally, on my far left is Yaron Brook, who's the president and the exec executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute. He has also been uh, an Israeli army intelligence officer. He has a PhD in finance from the University of Chicago. He has taught at Santa Clara University uh, and has been active in uh, um, uh, discussions of international issues for a number of years. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to offer some opening remarks and then I will attempt to uh, compare and contrast some of those, their thoughts. Let's start with Steve Clemens. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the Smith Family Foundation for hosting this, uh, this great event. Uh, I, we, we were just down in the holding room having a laugh, and uh, our moderator asked us around, say, well, where generally are you? And I said, well, I'm the guy who wants to talk before bombing. And one of my colleagues, I won't, I won't tell you who, uh, said, well, I'm for bombing and not talking. Um, <laughs> And may, maybe that, that captures where we're going. Um, one part of my vita that, that, that wasn't mentioned, but I'm, I'm proud of it, and I put it out here to give you some idea of uh, my DNA in thinking about this, I was the founding director of the Nixon Center. And so in the Nixon Center, it's essentially a home of uh, essentially realist deal makers and, and people who eventually found it possible to jump out of circumstances that look pretty miserable uh, to create a different set of equilibriums, uh, particularly with Nixon with regard to China, uh, we could address Vietnam and other matters at some point if you'd like. But um, where I see us going today, and, and, and just in the limited time I have, I thought I would throw out some issues of sort of thinking about what we get if we attack Iran uh, before we discuss the negotiations, and, and to have a kind of unsentimental look at, at that uh, on both ends, uh, the positives and the, and the negatives as I see them. At attacking Iran gets us, uh, to some degree, the ability to send a message of American military resolve, of the ability to apply force uh, to try to change outcomes and achieve objectives, particularly at a time when much of the world sees us uh, showing our limits. And when the, as I have written on my blog, you know, the mystique of American power has been punctured. If you show your limits, two things happen. Your allies move, uh, your allies don't count on you as much, and your enemies move their agendas. And I think that's largely what's happening in the world today, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Israel or Japan or Korea. Behaviors of our friends are changing, but so too are the agendas of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, uh, Kim Jong-il in North Korea, and certainly Ahmadinejad uh, in, in Iran and, and other places. So the global equilibrium has been thrown off, but 
there's no doubt that bombing Iran would send a message of American military resolve and a continued willingness to apply power uh, to, to uh, uh, policy choices. It may, in fact, delay Iran's nuclear ambitions and pretensions. It could even knock back some degree Iran's ability to expand its influence uh, very rapidly over the Middle East. Um, and it could create crisis conditions in Iran that could potentially, I'm, I doubt it, but could potentially be exploited uh, in which reformers could, could uh, come, uh, bring around a different event. So I think all of that has to be put on the table when you do it. But let's look at some other consequences. The, the, the downside is that President Ahmadinejad, who is not uh, uh, in the most powerful spot in, in Iran, there are many moving pieces to the Iranian uh, political spectrum, and I think that he and the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard would love nothing else to fi find a way to further consolidate power uh, in ways that they don't enjoy today. Uh, secondly, while I think that Iran is a fake democracy, nonetheless it has certain trappings and cosmetics of public choice. And one thing that you want to think about, if any of you are game th theorists or strategists, one thing you, that is very scary in the world is to have a ticked off state that does acquire nuclear weapons, that is in fact democratically elected and, and, and achieve some kind of legitimacy. That's absolutely the worst box you could possibly uh, find yourself in. And <clears throat> so I worry about not achieving our ambitions of knocking <coughs> Iran off of its nuclear <coughs> weapons course and seeing that come along and actually basically empowering a state that becomes even more dedicated uh, in that direction but has the trappings or at least the appearance of democratic legitimacy. The third thing which I worry about, uh, I've been to Israel the, uh, three times in the last um, 18 months, and I am, am nowhere near the expert, at least of, of, of two of the other panelists here, but I find Israeli security very, very important. I'm not one who believes that the narrative of any broader gain in the Middle East automatically means a net zero sum loss for Israeli security. I'm somebody who does believe that there's a possibility of other kinds of bargains and deal making in the region and the establishment of the equilibrium can, can be just as healthy for Israeli security uh, as uh, uh, other choices. But what I do worry about is that striking Iran could tilt us towards the creation of a terrorist superhighway that essentially removes all barriers to controls, which I think Iran very clearly does fund Hezbollah, Hamas, mischief. But there's no reason why you wouldn't expect that to be much higher unless Iran was making strategic choices as to why it was keeping its level of activity rather low. I worry about when that, not only when it turns up the temperature, but when the temperature gauge gets blown off, what you end up empowering in terms of a mass uncontrollable problem of terrorists right through Iran, uh, through Iraq, into Syria and Jordan, right up to the edge of Israel, in which you then do have a genuine existential problem for Israel that uh, uh, I think will ultimately be our problem as well. You also have something that's not often talked about, is that Iran, uh, it, in its undeveloped fossil fuel and uh, uh, natural gas resources, is right up there with Russia. Now, Saudi Arabia is a giant, of course, but many of its resources is are very developed. But in terms of looking at undeveloped uh, energy resources of the future, um, Iran is a, is a superpower. Uh, Russia, too, is a superpower in energy. And the two of them tied together are very, to me, very scary condominium of interest that might not tilt our way, nor Russia's way, nor Japan's way. And when you add to that Chinese capital, Chinese interests in their own ambitions in energy, you could very easily imagine an axis of oil interests that is automatically removes uh, the United States primacy in, in oil issues for region. I know it's in politics to talk about oil and wars, but nonetheless, those strategic issues matter. And I think it's very, very important for us to consider uh, uh, what the world looks like after bomb. Uh, the other thing I worry about is bombing Iran isn't just about Israel, the United States, and Iran, or even in Iraq. It's also about moderate Sunni regimes who have invested a lot in the U.S. relationship, who themselves fall and crumble or see assassinations because of the attack. And, and basically, you end up with a cauldron of convulsions in the region that, that, that knock down many governments. All of the things I'm describing uh, have to be considered as, as likely possibilities, as very clear possibilities of what could happen with this action. That doesn't mean that you should appease um, 
Ahmadinejad and the very bad behaviors. It doesn't mean you turn a blind eye to the fact that I do think Iran is on a nuclear weapons course. We can debate that or you know not. I've talked to Chinese and Russian intelligence people who think Iran is as well. So uh, those people who are certain rivals to us geopolitically uh, have these concerns. But the, the, the reason that I favor, uh, and very quickly, a, a negotiated direction uh, with Iran is because I do believe that it is a, a patchwork of interests in Iran, of competing interests inside Iran, and I actually have some hope that Iran might move towards a healthier direction in terms of civil society down the road, and I don't want to empower an Ahmadinejad. I think that Iran was given a great gift uh, uh, by the United States of taking away its chief rival in the region, and any serious strategist would have known that the moment Saddam was gone and knocked out of power, Iran's pretensions and hopes about its ability to influence affairs in the Middle East would grow dramatically. And we had no action plan to really deal with that. Um, I think that, that Iran has uh, worked with us and cooperated with us in the Bosnian War. They worked with us to help pacify and bring together stability in Afghanistan. Uh, the Iraq Study Group report, which I had meant to come up here and sort of show people to take a look at again, uh, makes the point, both Republicans and Democrats, that Iran has acted uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that converged with our interests. Iran is a careful strategic calculator of its interests, but I think there are a lot of uncertainties that we don't know. Uh, it's a paranoid state worried about regime change, and, and uh, the question is how you want to pursue that. In my view, we've not been a very good regime change um, advocate given the kind of bluster that we've had that ends up reinforcing the wrong interests in Iran. The question is how you can get that dynamic right so that you can get both I think real reform over time uh, diminish the paranoia of the state where it uses a high fear anxiety to justify bad decisions and, and to move in a different direction. I think much of this is possible in terms of a negotiated outcome in Iran. I will probably refer to later, I don't want to go into it deeply because Justin Logan will mention it. In 2003, Iran made such a proposal uh, uh, to the United States that was, I think it feared our ability to roll over Iraq, and it suggested an outline for a comprehensive negotiation with the United States that would cover many, many of the outstanding areas of concern that we have. Would it be real? Would it fall apart? You know, I was tributing today on the blog uh, our achievements with North Korea, noting the fact that two months from now, even tomorrow, they could blow up. Negotiated direction is a very, very unpredictable, fragile course that requires building trust and confidence among two states that don't trust and don't have, don't trust each other and don't have any confidence in one another. So it's going to take a lot of work to, to achieve the outcome I'm talking about. I'm not naive, but nonetheless, uh, it, is, it is something that I think uh, is far better than, than launching the nightmarish scenario uh, on the bombing front. Thank you. Okay, Steve, thank you. Let me turn now to Hillel Friedkin. <clears throat> thank you. Um, let me also begin by thanking the Smith Family Foundation and also the American Islamic Congress for organizing this event and, and especially for in, inviting me to participate. Um, the issue, uh, uh, the way it was framed was a time for talks, can and should the U.S. make deals with Iran and, and also secondarily Syria. And uh, I'm going to, this issue concerns a, um, a most serious and important issue, deriving primarily, and here I, I'm going to depart a little bit from uh, the, the range of Steve's remarks, uh, if not exclusively from a most important and serious problem the current situation in Iraq, and I'm, I'm going to approach it from that uh, uh, angle. I mean, various other reasons can and may be advanced for talking to Syria and Iran, especially Iran, and especially because of the nuclear issue, and uh, perhaps, uh, it's almost certain we'll touch on them uh, later. But it seems to me that it's the situation in Iraq, the violence, insecurity, instability, in short, the chaos in Iraq, which has most vigorously pushed forward the proposal to engage Iran and Syria. And this proposal emerged as one of the principal recommendations of the Iraq study group that uh, Steve just mentioned, chaired by Lee Hamilton and James Baker. Uh, let me note for full disclo disclosure that I was advisor to this group and took part in its discussions, and uh, to a considerable degree, my understanding of the, the uh, proposal for negotiations to discuss and discussions reflects um, how that issue was understood by them and why it was proposed. 
all this is to say from my point of view that the current proposal to talk to Iran and Syria has been put forward with a view to a very concrete goal and should and must be evaluated in a suitably concrete way. One must also ask concretely what are the potential costs of such talks as well as the risks um, involved in not only failure but even success. So would talks with Iran and Syria help to achieve stability in Iraq? The argument on, on behalf of this view rests on the notion that Iran and Syria, Syria share our desire for stability and want to avoid chaos both now and the future, both within Iraq and within the region. You will find this uh, view stated uh, prominently in the Iraq study group, as well as in uh, study group report, as well as in various articles which advance uh, basically a similar view. Now, if such were truly the case, there would be good grounds for talks. In fact, if it was truly the case, we, wouldn't, we almost wouldn't need them. We would just be working side by side on, uh, for the same end. The problem with this is that there is not a shred of evidence on its behalf. In fact, there is enormous evidence to the contrary. Iran has been acting in such a way as to guarantee instability and chaos by providing arms, support, and training, not only to one party to the dispute in Iraq, but at different times to several, and not only to several different groups of Shiites, but Sunnites as well. I think it, it's obvious that this is the perfect prescription for chaos and, and is meant to, to produce it. In the face of this evidence, another argument has been advanced. It may be that Iran underwrote the previous chaos and violence. However, in the long term, this chaos and violence will not be in its interest. If it does not yet see things this way, it can be helped to do so by talks and negotiations. In short, this argument suggests that we, we understand Iran's interests better than they do and that we can bring them around to a better understanding of their own uh, uh, interests. The premise of this argument is that all states eventually, if not immediately, find a chaotic and violent neighbor to be a menace. Among other things, the internal conflict of one state has the tendency to draw in various neighboring states and thus threatens to put these neighboring states into a direct conflict of their own, which they don't necessarily want. And, and more than that, it makes them hostage to the warring forces within uh, the chaotic state. But the question arises, is Iran a state like all other states? Does it calculate its interests like other states do? The answer, in my view, is no, or at least not yet. Um, one way of seeing what the issue is uh, uh, was, um, uh, is the way Henry Kissinger put it some time back in an op-ed piece, that the way he put it was, Iran faces and must choose between being a state or being a cause, being a revolutionary cause. Uh, he insisted that they will have to choose, and perhaps they will have to, but, but Iran has not yet chosen, or rather it still chooses to be a revolutionary regime rather than primarily a state. There may be a variety of reasons for this, but one is for present purposes sufficient. Only the revolutionary character of the Islamic Republic legitimates the authority of its current rulers, and I would add, inspires sufficient morale among um, its cadres uh, to maintain this authority, cadres um, that it needs to, uh, to inspire in order to maintain its rule. The leaders are not, will <coughs> not willing to give up their rule, and this interest trumps all others, including what we one might uh, vaguely call an Iranian uh, state interest, uh, in the calculation of their policy. The other, thus, the question with respect to Iran and how it will behave is whether the chaos in Iraq is supportive of their revolutionary ambitions or undermines it. This question is barely, if at all, addressed by the proponents of negotiations. At all events, it is not obvious, not obvious to me, that chaos is not desirable from this point of view. A, a certain kind of chaos is um, is a desirable uh, situation for a, a revolutionary regime. And in fact, um, I noted today there was uh, recently published the memoirs uh, of uh, the 
French minister Auguste Blasi, uh, who reports that he had a conversation with Ahmadinejad uh, in September 2005, in which he uh, uh, said that he uh, welcomes and prefers chaos. But not, might not, to take up a third uh, way of, of uh, uh, supporting negotiations, might not a bold initiative of direct talks change the calculus of Iran's leaders? Might not the respect it ostensibly would provide them gratify them and address their most in important interest, the long-term security of their rule. Well, we have already had an experiment along these lines. More than three years ago, in the summer of 2003, the United States government acceded to a European request to support direct talks with Iran on nuclear issues. We supported that. These, alas, led nowhere. The argument for why they led nowhere was that we were not a direct participant. So, about a year ago, and after much debate, the U.S. offered to join these talks directly, subject to the condition that Iran suspend, not um, uh, forego uranium enrichment. That, too, has produced no change on the part of, of Iran. On the contrary, the only thing which has produced some reconsideration on the part of its leadership, and only very recently, is a number of more combative steps the UN Security Resolution of December, the restrictions on some of Iran's banks, and the provision of anti-missile batteries to the Gulf countries, uh, and finally, uh, the dispatch of another carrier fleet. Um, I want to stress here that I'm not suggesting, uh, uh, I guess it's one's supposed to have either before or against bombing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I might be for bombing, but not yet. Uh, <laughs> and I'm certainly, but I am certainly for more uh, combative steps of the sort that I mentioned just now. For all these reasons, I see no reason to hope for anything from direct talks to Iran or Syria at this time. But what are their costs should we decide to pursue them? Are there any? Uh, or could, could it just be a freebie? Well, there are some. We would certainly disappoint the majority of the Iranian people who would understand us to be acquiescing in their current fate. Well, uh, too bad. <laughs> it, is quite po it is quite possible, if not certain, that the Lebanese government would lose such independence of Syria as it currently enjoys. I think it's almost certain, actually. Well, what of it? It is, after all, a small country. And I, I uh, should mention that in the discussion, discussions of what an opening to Iran and Syria would mean, uh, a number of people who uh, uh, are quite hard-headed about this, uh, and not necessarily hard-hearted, but are hard-headed enough to understand that one thing that may be the price of this is the, uh, such independence as Lebanon has at present. They are for it nonetheless, but they understand that that is a, a serious prospective cost. Another cost, it will frighten, actually it already has frightened the hell out of countries like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt. Here things begin to look a little more serious, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf. How exactly will we take this problem into account? Uh, one option, of course, is to sell our cars. <laughs> Finally, there is Iraq itself. Will the Iranians immediately desist from the activities which menace our soldiers? Or will the Iranians be emboldened and continue their activities until the quote unquote successful completion of our talks, success being measured by an Iranian standard? I rather suspect the latter, given the character of the Iranian regime and all the precedents that we have with respect uh, to dealings with that country. And if the purpose of these talks will have been to prepare our departure from Iraq, which is uh, uh, actually um, the, the subtext of all of this, and perhaps from the region as a whole, we might just as well leave without talking to the Iranians at all, not even to say goodbye. Thank you. Hillel, thank you. Now we'll turn to Justin Logan. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, I would like to also thank, uh, in particular, Rohit Shah of the American Islamic Congress uh, for putting this event together. We sometimes joke in Washington that 
getting scholars together in the same place at the same time is like herding cats. Uh, and Rohit has successfully herded cats in an ice storm. So thank you for that, <laughs> Rohit. Um, also, I'd like to very much thank uh, Donald and Paul Smith and their family's foundation uh, for putting the event together today. Uh, in the, in the uh, description of our debate here today, there was a, a great deal of uh, ground covered, as we've already heard, and I wanted, like Steve, to focus my uh, uh, comments on Iran and its nuclear program, but by way of doing so, I want to see if I can tie in a, a, a bit of a response to some of the issues that, that Hillel Frodkin has raised thus far. I concur that I think that the Baker-Hamilton Commission's portrayal of Iran as wanting stability in Iraq above all is naive. Clearly, it does not want that above all. Um, however, however, I don't think that it's useful at this point to focus on looking to Iran to sort of bail out our unfavorable position in Iraq. Uh, I don't think at this point, quite frankly, if Iran and Syria at this point were to throw their weight 100 percent behind the U.S. project in Iraq, that it is uh, salvageable at this point. The forces in that country are already well outside the control of Iran and Syria, and clearly the United States. That said, if Iran could have stability in Iraq without providing a diplomatic victory for the United States, without allowing a project that the United States set in motion with implicitly, if not explicitly, the ultimate goal of having a domino effect in the region of toppling governments like Iran. I think in those circumstances, Iran would like to have stability in Iraq. So I think it's important to back those two questions out. Uh, I agree largely with the thrust of, of what Steve Clemens has said thus far. Um, and in one sense, the, uh, the title of our uh, topic tonight, uh, Iran and Syria, the time for talks, is a little, uh, uh, causes one to be a little rueful. Because in fact, this is not the time for talks. The time for talks was 2003, when the U.S. position in the region was at its height, when Mohammed Khatami was president of Iran, uh, and when Iran, in fact, made the United States what was a, a very workable uh, non-ideological offer. Uh, the offer that was made uh, via the Swiss Embassy uh, from Iran uh, put on the table uh, Iran offering transparency to ensure that Iran would neither, uh, that there would be, quote, no Iranian endeavors to possess or develop weapons of mass destruction. They offered cooperation on terrorism, particularly on Al-Qaeda, and cooperation on the project in Iraq, as well as potentially supporting the Arab League's Beirut Declaration, which has as its root the ultimate recognition of the State of Israel. What was on the, the table from the U.S. side in the Iranian formulation was repealing both U.S. and Western sanctions on Iran, normalizing U.S. and Iranian <coughs> diplomatic relations, making sure that Iran has access to peaceful technology, as well as U.S. movement on the mujahideen e organization, a, a, a terrorist organization that has worked for the overthrow of the Iranian regime, which at the time was being protected by the U.S. Army in Iraq. We turned this offer down. So 2003, I think, really was the time for talks. At the same time, I think it's important to look at this as a useful device for looking at what could be the contours of a grand bargain today, albeit under much, much more unfavorable circumstances. The truculence of U.S. policy in 2003, unfortunately, uh, has led us to look at our policy options vis-a-vis -vis Mahmoud Ahmadinejad as president, as opposed to Mohammed Khatami, and as well with an extremely, extremely grave and deteriorating U.S. position, not just in Iraq, but in the region generally. Um, and, and I want to talk about why I think that, that a diplomatic approach uh, uh, is the right approach at this point, and touching on a few of the areas of uncertainty with respect to U.S. knowledge about the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, there's a great deal of ambiguity about our intelligence as to simply the locations of facilities. Before the revelations that were made in 2002 by the NCRI, uh, an, a mujahideen e related organization, there was a great deal of ignorance on the U.S. side with respect to the Iranian nuclear program, and there's not much to believe that there is not a similar ignorance today. 
Uh, there is a second uncertainty about Iran's rate of progress toward a nuclear weapons capability. Since the early 1990s, I believe it was as early as 1991, the official U.S. intelligence estimate on Iran's nuclear program was five to ten years away. Uh, that was James Woolsey's CIA at, the, at that time, so I guess we can say what we will about that. Um, but thankfully, that, uh, that estimate was unduly dire. Um, and, and it has maintained, as of August 2005, uh, the U.S. intelligence community has, that Iran is five to ten years away from a nuclear bomb. So it's clear that our intelligence as to how close to having a nuclear capability uh, Iran has uh, has not been good at this point. Now, hopefully, we're, we are still overly uh, pessimistic. Hopefully, Iran, in fact, is 15 years away or 20 years away. Hopefully, that's the case. But I don't hold enough hope in that that, in fact, the reverse may not be the case, that, that our bad intelligence in one direction previously may not now be bad intelligence in the opposite direction. And that is why I think that we need to look very seriously about a decisive U.S.-led diplomatic approach along the lines of the contours of the deal that Iran offered in 2003 to attempt to resolve this problem. Like Steve, I have no sort of doe-eyed optimism about what can be yielded from such a process. Clearly, the Iranians are feeling their oats, not just sort of chortling at, at U.S. Uh, uh, failings in Iraq, but more broadly throughout the region. But offering the Iranians a grand bargain leaves every other option on the table. If a U.S. administration were to make overtures to Iran and say give them six months with a deal, take it or leave it, the hardest line hawk in Washington can fire up the B-2s whenever he likes. There is nothing to say that any policy option is foreclosed by attempting diplomacy. And indeed, I think it's a perverse commentary on the state of the debate in Washington that it is often incumbent on advocates of diplomacy to prove, indeed, that diplomacy will yield fruit before diplomacy has even begun. Diplomacy always, in the, in the Westphalian system generally, has been a process. It has not been this sort of decisive slam dunk outcome uh, that the opponents of diplomacy propose it should be today. And I also would like to close just by saying what we, where we have come by refusing to talk to the Iranians. As Hillel Fradkin has mentioned, on May 31st of last year, Secretary Rice uh, offered to join the EU3 negotiations on Iran with the precondition, some have called it a poison pill precondition, that Iran suspend uranium enrichment before coming to such talks. Well, since May 31st of last year through to today, the Iranians have not suspended enriching uranium. We have not engaged in a dialogue with Iran, and we find ourselves in the predicament where we're sending a third carrier strike group to the Persian Gulf, in Vice President Cheney's words, to show that we have, quote, significant capabilities, end quote, with which we can deal with the problem with Iran. I would submit the two have been talking to Iran all this time to see if there may be, in fact, a diplomatic resolution to this problem would have quite a low cost. Thank you. Justin, thank you. And finally, let's hear from your own Brooke. Thank you. Uh, I, too, would like to thank the uh, Smith, Fa Smith Family Foundation and the American Islamic Congress for putting on this event and, uh, and for inviting me. Uh, as you probably have guessed by now, I'm the guy who wants to bomb and not talk. Um, but let me elaborate a little bit on what I mean by that, because I accept a lot of Steve's uh, criticism of bombing. Uh, indeed, I don't think bombing is the solution. Uh, I think one needs a much more radical uh, solution uh, than just bombing. Um, <laughs> Bombing would indeed bring about many of the problems that Steve mentioned. Uh, it, it might uh, cause the regime in Iran to, to, to be entrenched, the, the more radical elements to be strengthened. I, I agree with Jason, uh, in terms of, Justin, in terms of the uh, uh, intelligence is weak. We don't know where the facilities are. Uh, it's unlikely we would cause them damage sufficient to destroy their nuclear option. Uh, we would just be postponing the inevitable. Um, I believe that the number one foreign policy priority of the United States is and should have been since at least 9-11, if not since November 4th, 1979, 
the replacement uh, of the regime in Iran. Uh, I think that the regime in Iran is a enemy regime. It, a regime. it is a regime that has been at war covertly, quietly, but at war with the United States and with uh, the U.S. allies uh, since November 4th, the day our embassy was taken uh, in Tehran in 1979. Uh, it has been at war with the United States, and you know, you could list the, 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 the attacks in Beirut, the Kobo Towers, the, the support for Hezbollah, and, and so on. But more broadly, uh, particularly uh, since 9-11, um, I think we're missing the whole point by talking about Iraq and talking about the interests of Iran and talking about kind of this, this realist approach to uh, uh, interests of, of various countries uh, because I think we're missing the much larger uh, ideological picture. And I think uh, Hillel mentioned that uh, uh, that Iran is, uh, is dominated by revolutionary cause. Absolutely, it is dominated by revolutionary cause. And, and Katami, who was mentioned here, uh, who you know, purported to be a moderate, um, was as dedicated to that revolutionary cause as, as any Iranian leader. He, he just presented a more Western, softer approach to it, but his dedication and his support for terrorism and, and his support for, for international terrorism you know, did not decline uh, during his period uh, as president. Uh, this revolutionary cause is the same revolutionary cause in different clothing because one is Shiite and one is Sunni, but it is basically the same revolutionary cause that motivated bin Laden, motivates the radical Sunnis in, in Iraq right now, and motivates al sadr in Iraq, and motivates the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and Hezbollah, and Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, and you can go through a very, very long list. It is the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism, radical Islam, militant Islam, different commentators call it different things. But that is what the bigger picture, the bigger war that we are engaged in is about. It is a war and we are at war. We don't know it, they know it. The other side knows that we are war. Uh, the West hasn't woken up to this fact yet. But we are at war with an ideology, an ideology in a Shiite variant, in a Sunni variant, in, in multiple, you know, they disagree with one another on lots of different things, but we are at war with an ideology called Islamic totalitarianism. Uh, we're at war with that ideology in the Middle East, in Iraq right now, we're at war with it in Israel, with the Hezbollah and Hamas, we're at war with it in Europe, uh, with the terrorist attacks and, 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 and the problems that I foresee getting much worse in Europe over the, over the coming decades. Iran, is the fountainhead, or one of the fountainheads of this ideology. Iran is the linchpin. Iran is the inspiration. Iran's existence, the regime, um, Iran's ability to stand up to America and to snub us and to develop nuclear weapons and to tell the, the West to take a hike and to create the chaos, and, and there's no question that it has been uh, a crucial element in creating the chaos in Iraq. Uh, Iran's activities uh, and Iran's unwillingness to bend is a major source of inspiration throughout the, the totalitarian, the radical uh, you know, movement uh, within Islam. Uh, recruitment to this movement is, is accelerating. Uh, this movement is gaining in force, and it gains in force because, to a large extent, because of what Steve said, we have lost all mystique. The, the West generally, and America in particular, have lost any kind of uh, legitimacy, but, but it's more than just legitimacy. They, they don't fear us, they don't respect us, they don't trust us. Um, and uh, that is feeding the, the radical elements uh, within the Middle East. Uh, you know, the, the, the Hezbollah and Hamas are emboldened like they've never been before. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, I think, uh, is, is the, the, the negative elements in Saudi Arabia, the more radical elements of Saudi Arabia uh, are going to be and are emboldened like never before. Uh, I, I think Syria is incredibly emboldened, and of course Iran is. So if we have any interest in the Middle East, and ultimately if we have any interest in winning this bigger war, uh, th this bigger struggle that I think uh, does exist today, then we have to stand up to Iran. We have to take out this regime that in many people's minds is the symbol.
in many minds is the symbol of Islamic totalitarian success, success against the West, standing up to us. Uh, if America is to win this war, um, it has, and, and I've claimed this since September 11th, uh, it has to start uh, with Iran. And in my view, it doesn't take much more than that because I think Iran is that important in the big picture of things. Thank you. Well, there seems to be some difference of opinion among our <laughs> panelists and difference in tone as well. Let me try to probe some of the things that uh, were said and see just where perhaps there might be some differences among you. Justin Logan said, the diplomatic approach is the right approach. No policy option is foreclosed if we try diplomacy. Let me ask Hillel and, and your own, what's wrong with that? Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> well, I, 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 I really don't, uh, certainly don't agree. So if that's what you were soliciting, I'll, I will certainly say that flat out. I, I don't think, uh, First of all, I think it's not a really, it's simply a question of whether it forecloses any uh, all uh, options. It can in, in, it can make things worse. I really there's a, a notion that was stated quite frequently, not not uh, simply by Justin, but in the discussions concerning negotiations with Iran and Syria that uh, talking never hurts. Well, it does. Um, it can. I'm not in all. It, it, sometimes it, it just depends on the circumstances. Um, to cite, I think uh, there are many cases one could cite, but there's, there's not time to go through through uh, many. Uh, I will offer one that has come up uh, many times in recent months concerning the present situation, and that is the uh, situation in 1938 with respect to the little country known as Czechoslovakia. Uh, It was argued then that talking, uh, the talks undertaken by the British government with the Nazi government um, couldn't hurt. Well, they did. They encouraged, um, they in encouraged uh, Hitler, and they wound up not preventing the, um, uh, or, uh, the destruction of that country, but uh, in fact fostering it. So there are circumstances in which diplomacy, talking, actually does harm. Uh, and I think it does, it, it, it would do harm here. I, uh, I focus my remarks on Iraq, but on, on the nuclear, uh, the other, um, my co-panelists uh, focused on Iran. Um, the grand bargain that was offered in 2003 um, was actually uh, a, a result of the fact that we did seem, in fact, forceful and powerful. And by the way, it's certainly true that Mujahideen and Khalki is a terrorist organization, but they are, are basically our sole source of information about the, the Iranian nuclear program. Um, I mean, subsequent to their discoveries or to their revelations, um, the IAEA went in, in there and confirmed them. So uh, it, the, the Iranians have a very powerful interest in, in suppressing these people because they're the only uh, competent intelligence agency in the region, apparently. <laughs> Let me ask you around the same question. Uh, what's your view? What, what's, to be, what's to be harmed by engaging in some uh, negotiations, some discussions, some diplomacy? Well, I think there's huge harm. Uh, I, I think that it emboldens the enemy. I think it shows our weakness. Uh, I think it, it, it prevents us ultimately from, I don't think that all options are open after negotiations because the Iranians are smart. Uh, they'll negotiate. They'll negotiate for a long time. Uh, I think the model, I mean, certainly 1938 Munich is, is a great example. I think even a better example is uh, Israel's uh, opening negotiations with the Palestinians pre-Oslo, which I think is one of the most disastrous moves, certainly the most disastrous move Israel has made in its history. Uh, we have seen what has happened with Oslo. It, it has just been an opening for more and more terrorism and more and more negotiations. It, it's endless. There's always more to negotiate, and, and the fact is that um, one's enemies thrive on that. They use negotiations as another weapon, um, and uh, once you've given in to the idea of negotiations, uh, there's, no, there's no stopping it. And I believe that in the meantime, what the Iranians will do, they'll talk, 
they'll sit down, they'll give in on a few points, and in the meantime, they'll develop the nuclear bomb, and one day, we'll all wake up just before the grand, you know, the big deal is signed with a nuclear Iran walking away from, from the negotiating. Uh, so, so I think there's enormous harm uh, that, that negotiations can bring about. Let me ask just... just Yes, Justin Thanks. and Steve, are you convinced by your panelists on this? Well, let, me, let me jump in. Yeah, um, it, it, Yaron Brook may be right. He may be. But it, it is not a declaratory statement. We cannot divine from the, the, the sort of looking in from the outside with certainty what Iran's approach would be. And I, I must say that if what I advocated was endless negotiations, I misspoke. I, that is not what I'm in favor of at all, and I think it is a real disservice to American diplomats to, to portray them sort of as, as, as the stereotypical sort of stuffy Brit stumbling around in the soup looking for chicken. Um, I, I also would sort of point to the 1938 analogy as just an egregiously overused analogy. If we had Gamal Abdel, Abdel Nasser was the next one. Slobodan Milosevic was the next Hitler. Saddam Hussein was the next Hitler. Uh, thank goodness Hitler was an aberration. In this circumstance, the 1938 analogy doesn't work at all. The United States is the global superpower. The United States has more military capabilities than any conceivable combination of countries in the world. And to put, I think, Iran, revolutionary Iran with a decrepit, sclerotic economy on par with a war machine like Nazi Germany really sort of misses the, sort of the whole nature of the topic that we have. And that's why I really would, would differ with, with Iran's characterization as, as, of Iran as having been a success. It is not a success. It is a disaster. Uh, so I think that we really need to be careful about sort of falling into what, what no one on this panel, but some people in Washington do, sort of fall victim to this sort of strategic hypochondria where, where it's as though we're not an $11 trillion economy. We don't have the ability to sustain a, a, a 500 or now perchance 600 or 700 billion dollar per year defense budget. And we can brought to, be brought to our knees uh, by any variety of uh, unsafe reactors from Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to Hugo Chavez. So. If it's a, but if it's a failure and, and, and so weak, why should we bother with it at all? Because I think it has things that we want. And that is to say, it's nuclear program. It, it, it is not a, a massive, you know, it was not unreasonable in 1938 to conceive that Nazi Germany could in fact successfully overrun all of Western Europe. I, this sort of nightmare scenario akin to that, which maybe this will now open the question of whether or not uh, uh, the clerical leadership in Tehran would be willing to launch an unprovoked Nuclear strike, uh, but the nightmare scenario, it seems to me, just di isn't akin to what Hitler's Germany was in 1938. I, I, think, I think, though, the parallel is different. I, I agree, it certainly isn't. And, and by the way, Iran is a failure from Western eyes. Iran is certainly not a failure from the eyes of those who share its ideology. Um, I think, that, I think that what's akin is that we're dealing in both uh, Germany uh, of 1938 uh, and, and Iran today, we're dealing with an ideology, uh, a totalitarian ideology, a completely irrational ideology, ideology dedicated to murder. Uh, and uh, I, it's true, and, and this is my case for regime change. The United States is an $11 trillion economy. The United States has the mightiest military force in the history of mankind. The United States could do whatever it wanted. Well, it should do something for its own self-defense. Uh, I think that's the purpose of the U.S. military. And, and, and what that means is it should take out not an enemy that's going to wipe, you know, it's going to take its tanks and roll through Europe uh, as, as, as Germany did. It, we're talking about an enemy that is going to fund and, and uh, encourage terrorist activity against our interests across the entire world, already has, has been doing it for over 20 years, and will continue to do so. And as it gets emboldened, and if one day it gets nuclear weapons, not so much that they would use the nuclear weapons, but imagine how much terrorism they would sponsor when they had a nuke to protect them from a U.S. attack, 
as compared to today when they know we could wipe them out easily, you know, without much effort. So the, 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 a nuclear Iran is going to be a much more horrific enemy to the United States. Again, not, on the, not in the sense that Hitler was, but in the sense of the new warfare uh, that has proven so effective against the West, and that is terrorism. Let me ask our other panelists, uh, let me ask Steve. Uh, Iran essentially is talking about regime change. Uh, that word has, uh, that term has uh, lost favor, certainly in some circles, <laughs> uh, as a very difficult thing to accomplish. What's your view on that? Just as a, right or wrong, as a practical matter, is that, is that a workable solution? He's anywhere? moving us to the yes, no uh, uh, part of the program. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of thugs in the world, and there are thugs running Iran. Uh, there are thugs that we need us to help achieve our objectives in their world, and there are thugs that stand diametrically opposed to what we want. Um, it's not nice and neat to, to, to be able to uh, just, just, just right away all the thugs with the magic wand. It takes resources, will, and I would argue that in Iraq, and I would argue in Iran, and foreign policy in general today, we're pursuing most of our objectives on the cheap and you can't achieve any of the objectives, nowhere near what Yaron is talking about, uh, on the cheap. It's remarkable how much I agree with some of the objectives he has with regime change and how remarkable my methodology would be or the advice I would give the President of the United States in pursuing any of this would be. The President, at the end of the day, has to assure that American interests are, are furthered. And I would argue that we've entered a period of time which has been a bit blind to some of the realities that we have seen uh, out there. And unfortunately, American interests have declined dramatically. American capacity has declined dramatically. All of our capacities to achieve the kind of a vision that Yaron would like us to pursue have declined dramatically. How did that happen? Unless you fix that problem of delivering security deliverables and of managing American interests and taking on great causes, that may be regime change, et cetera, then all of this is folly. Can I just respond? Uh, let, let, me, let me just uh, uh, elaborate on what I mean by regime change, because I don't think I mean what was meant suddenly before you walk. And, and it, let me also uh, correct what I don't think the people running Iran are thugs. Uh, I think there's a, there's a difference to be made between Saddam Hussein and the people running Iran. Saddam Hussein was a thug. Uh, there are many thugs in the world. Uh, the Iranian leaders are ideological. They are not just thugs trying to accumulate as much power and wealth and, and you know, in it for the, for, the, for the, I guess, the nihilistic pleasure of torturing people. Uh, I think they believe in it. At least many of them believe in it. And I think they are supported, and I know there's a lot of empirical evidence both ways on this. They're supported by a significant percentage of the population. How many? I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, you know, probably more than anybody expects uh, based on, on voting patterns in Iran. And, and again, I think the moderates in Iran are not exactly moderate. Um, so, so I think that, the, I think that the, 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 the target for regime change needs to be focused on those regimes that are ideologically our enemy, not on thugs. Thugs can be dealt with in a variety of different means, sanctions, all kinds of ways you can deal with thugs. Uh, we're at war. Uh, with an ideology, we need to identify the source of that ideology. Iran is certainly one of those sources. I think it needs to be taken out. I also don't want to uh, come across as uh, claiming that we need to change the regime for something. Um, the only for something that I would advocate is something that's not ideologically opposed the way the current regime is to the United States. I'm not an advocate of the forward strategy of freedom of democracy, of bringing democracy to the Middle East, or the domino theory, I don't believe in it. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that part of the world is ready for that. Uh, and I don't think America should be exerting resources, troops, money, effort um, uh, to do that. What America needs to make clear are the consequences of going to war against it, the consequences of being, uh, of, of declaring war on it. Uh, and, and, and so when I call the regime change, I don't really care who replaces them as long as they're not uh, Islamic totalitarians. Can I, can I pose one quick question? When, on, on the night of 9-11, uh, 2001, uh, a remarkable thing happened in the Middle East. Tehran happened to be the only place that tens of thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of Iranians went into the, the night with candles and were quiet and silent and were not uh, uh, cheering as in many other capitals in the Middle East, even among some of our allies, uh, alleged allies uh, in the Middle East. So I, I'm... I'm interested in what you think that was about. Were those the people that were ideologically tied to their 
theocratic <laughs> leadership? Or no, I, I, th I think there's a struggle within Iran, and I think, but I think that struggle is far more limited than what we believe it is. I think there's certainly a, a class within Iran, particularly among the students and among the intelligentsia, who are pro-Western. And I think that by abandoning them, by, by showing our weakness, they are being weakened themselves. And, and I'm not necessarily advocating regime change if there is another way. I'm not an expert on this. If there's a way of supporting our internal revolution in Iran and not using American force at all, I'd be the first to sign up on that. I, I just don't, I'm not convinced that there is such an option. But if there are these masses who are pro-American, let's support them, let's arm them, let's do whatever's necessary to eliminate the regime as it currently stands uh, in Iran. If that doesn't work, then the use of force has to be an option, in my view. Hillel, you want to comment? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to uh, follow up on, on the issue that Steve has raised about uh, resources and uh, uh, trying to do things on the cheap. Um, I, I, don't, I actually don't think our resources have declined substantially. Uh, that's because we have an $11 trillion economy and it just keeps pumping along and, and keeps producing these resources. What we may be a little bit uh, short of at the moment is, is confidence. But I do agree that we, we have tried to, to do things um, a little bit too, too carefully. So I, I want to uh, suggest in, in this particular case, if we are going to attack Iran, if it should come to that, uh, we certainly shouldn't do it. Um, well, actually, we will do it in a certain way on the cheap, because it will be a, a, effectively an air war. We won't put any troops on the ground. But it makes no sense to simply attack the nuclear sites uh, uh, exclusively. It, it, if we're going to go that far, we should attack regime targets. And that means um, the headquarters of the Revolutionary Guard, the headquarters of the Basij, the Pastiran, uh, various other facilities on which the regime depends. Um, that would, it seems to me, open, it would at least permit um, uh, an answer to the question that's been raised in the last couple of minutes. Is there sufficient will within the uh, Iranian populace to uh, change their regime? Do they want to and could they if they were liberated from um, a countervailing force for which they have no, no response? So um, in that regard, I, I do agree with you, Steve. We've, been, we've tried to... Um, tailor solutions to problems um, uh, very, very narrowly and, and way too narrowly. I think it's interesting that uh, there continues to be a wide range of views on this subject. I think it's uh, more than we can resolve tonight. Uh, I think going forward it will be very interesting to see both what policies the U.S. pursues, but also what policies and what changes take place in Iran itself. Uh, we've reached the end of our time, and I hope you'll join me in saying thank you to our speakers. Thank you.